Marvel Future Fight is a blockbuster action RPG and... Wait. I'm not doing a sales pitch for free. Netmarble, reach out and add me to the Star Creator Club or something and then we'll talk. So this is a video that I actually first talked about at the end of my very first ever YouTube video, and unfortunately I had an uphill battle against both SQL and my computer before we were able to get here. I am going to use SQL or Structured Query Language, which is a programming language that is used for analyzing data using databases. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I don't want to get bogged down in the nitty gritty technical jargon, but if you're interested, I am going to put together a video where where I explain in detail how I created the database and each of the queries and commands that I use to get the analysis that I do in this video. That is going to go up over on my Patreon in a couple of days, so if you're interested in seeing that, consider giving that a look. Link in the description. However, I've finally gotten my data figured out, so let's go ahead and dive right in with Real quick, before we actually get going, I do want to give a massive shout out and thank you to you slash Mark Gibbons 85 over on Reddit. He created and maintains a spreadsheet that is a record of every single update ever in Marvel Future Fight, which was, need I say, an incredible resource for purposes of putting this video together. Absolutely cannot overstate how useful that was. Links to both his profile on Reddit and that spreadsheet in the doobly-doo. As far as actually getting ready to do my analysis was concerned, I grouped the data that I gathered into five categories. First off, I had update metadata, which is stuff like the update theme and the update's release date, as well as the official app version for that update, for example, 1.0.0 for the actual release of the game. Second, I had character information, which for purposes of this, I basically limited to the character's name and the update in which they were released. Third, and most time consuming to collect, I had upgrade information, which was referring to tier 3 potential transcendence and tier 4 releases. These are generally considered content, but they weren't something that was included in Mark's spreadsheet, so I had to go and hunt them down myself, and I actually couldn't find the literal patch notes for Ghost Riders tier 3 specifically, so I had to guesstimate which update he was in based on my best recollection, but for the most part I was able to find and track down all of these. Luna Snow took me forever. Fourth, we have information about uniforms, which are kind of the most common content in the game, including the uniform's name, what character it's for and when it was released. Fifth and finally, we have game mode information. This was a little bit more nuanced than the other ones because game modes get changed more often than characters or uniforms do, and so I didn't feel the need to track that for characters and uniforms, but sometimes a game mode getting a change is massive content in and of itself. I took not all of the information that was in Mark's spreadsheet for game modes, but I did take whenever a game mode was added to the game, whenever it was significantly reworked, whenever it was expanded, such as receiving a new boss in World Boss Legend, and whenever a game mode was removed from the game. Most of the stuff that I left out was just, you know, balance tweaks, which I don't think anybody really considers content anyways. As far as I'm concerned, these are the really big types of content in Marvel Future Fight, and so these are the things that I wanted to stick to, but I am interested to see if there's anything that you think that I've overlooked or blown out of proportion in the comments down below. Once I had my data collected in my spreadsheet and formatted the way that I wanted to, I loaded it into a database that I could extract the meaningful relationships from it more easily. This is where I got hung up for a while, until I recognized that I could get around the issues that I was having by using view tables. More information on that on the Patreon video. My very first attempt at extracting the information that I needed resulted in this query. Basically what it does is count up how many characters, upgrades, uniforms, and game mode changes were made, and then group that count by updates so that we can see in each update how much content there was. Nifty. I went ahead and transferred the results back to Google Sheets and used used that to create a line graph showing how this number changes over time. Unfortunately, a couple of things stick out to me as problems with this. First of all, this graph is really, really spiky, and it turns out that that's because mid-month updates have less content than full updates do, obviously. So updates like 4.6.5 or 6.5.1 have one or two pieces of content compared to main updates that might have eight or nine. It's easy to understand why this happens, but at a glance, it can actually be 
pretty misleading in terms of what the chart represents. Even more subtly, though, is the fact that update 5.0.0, which should be right around, maybe even slightly past the game's halfway point, occurs around the one-third mark on our graph, meaning that the second half of the game's lifespan is being expanded. I think that this is due to the increasing number of mid-month and partial updates that we receive, arbitrarily stretching out the size of the graph, and creating further misunderstanding of what the graph represents. Fortunately, I had the foresight to think about the fact that mid-month updates were probably going to skew my data somewhat, which is why I had included the release date for each update in my metadata. I was able to go back and, with a little bit more work, create a second query that groups content by month released, as opposed to by update, which did result in a graph that is less arbitrarily spiky and more evenly spaced out over time. However, it had the unforeseen side effect of skipping some months. When I say this, I don't mean that the query was arbitrarily skipping over certain months, but rather that for some reason some months were coming back with a total content count of zero. Upon closer inspection of the November 2016 gap, which was the first one that I noticed, I found that the Marvel Studios Doctor Strange update, their pretentious label, not mine, dropped on the 26th of October, while the Asgardians update had been released on the 7th of December. The gap between these two updates is not that much larger than is average for the game, however, it just happens to be long enough and awkwardly enough placed that it falls on either side of November, and again creates misleading information in our graph. Bearing this potential issue in mind, and noticing the pattern of there being 10 updates per year, I opted to go back to an update-based approach to graphing the information. However, this time, instead of separately graphing mid-month and sub-updates, I decided to graph everything as a single update. For instance, instead of treating 2.9.0, 2.9.1, 2.9.5, and 2.9.7 as four separate updates with smaller amounts of content in each, I opted to treat them as the singular 2.9.x and group all of their content count together. This solved the misleading spacing issue by standardizing when different data points are being collected, but also helps to avoid the issue of arbitrarily skipping over periods of time in the graph by making sure that the data points are being gathered at a consistent interval. The resulting graph doesn't have what I would describe as any glaringly obvious biases, although again, if I've missed something, I would be fascinated to hear what you have to say in the comments below, and also lines up with most of my expectations. The biggest jumps, for instance, being 1.0.0 when the game was actually released and the bulk of content was included, and 5.0.0, or the Avengers Endgame update, which features near double the standard amount of uniforms due to the inclusion of both standard and time travel uniforms for each character who participated in that arc. This graph does show what I intuitively expected was going to be the case. Content additions to the game are not only fairly consistent over the game's lifespan, but also also get more consistent as time goes on and the team gets better at what they're doing. What I was not expecting, however, was the fact that there is a seeming increase in the average amount of content per update since the Avengers Endgame update. In fact, the amount of content included in each update is impressively high. Every update since 5.3.x includes at least 10 new items per update, and every new update since 7.9.x beats 13. Ignore 9.5.x dropping to 11, that value is missing the Loki Season 2 update. Update. So that satisfied my initial question of, is there less content in the game than there used to be? But if there is still a reasonable amount of content, then why are there so many people who are frustrated and complaining about a lack of content? That feels backwards to me. I suspect that the issue lies in the quality of the content as opposed to the quantity of the content, but unfortunately I can't just put a bunch of numbers into a database and pop out a pretty graph that answers that question, at least not without consulting the IRB first. Instead, to attempt to answer this question, I want to turn to a discussion of To describe opinions on what makes good content in this game as widely and aggressively varied would likely be considered an understatement. To drive home the point of just how diverse opinions are, this is a thumbnail that I saw shortly before the Spider-Verse 2 update, complaining about getting pregnant Jessica Drew in the game before getting a new character, unfortunately posted just a couple of days before Spot was confirmed as a new character in the game for that movie, that aged like milk. While diametrically opposed, this is a comment that I saw under one of the sneak peeks for the upcoming update complaining about new characters in the game instead of reworking existing ones. You really can't please everybody, or if we're being honest, 
anybody. However, if there's one thing that people generally tend to agree is good content, it's game modes. But even then, do they? The majority of game modes introduced into this game don't go on to become defining game modes. Outside of World Boss, in fact, most game modes aren't something that people are manually playing every single day. If anything actually serves to underscore just how much game modes aren't actually perpetual good content, it's update 5.5.0, the absolute giga chad that removed four entire game modes from the game. One game mode introduction, however, stands out among the rest as an absolutely fantastic change with a lasting influence on the way that people play the game. World Boss Legend Null. Null was introduced at a point in time when the World Boss meta was stagnant. Because Ultimate Difficulty World Bosses were susceptible to debuffs, you could beat every World Boss Ultimate in the game by spending the $10 to acquire and rank up Weapon Hex, who had a skill that could reduce their defensive stats by 100%. With very few exceptions, you could power through most of what made each boss different from the rest, if you just happen to have a good team and weapon hex on your striker list. Null absolutely crushed this meta multiple times over. Right out the gate, he has blanket immunity to every debuff in the game. All defense down doesn't matter when literally no debuff can apply. However, he takes things even a step further and applies the same one use per day limit that always applied to the damage dealing characters on your team in World Boss Ultimate and applies it to your secondary striker character list as well. Even if weapon hex could apply her all defense down, you could only use her for one clear a day, completely neutering the strategy. These two particular changes introduced in World Boss Legend really breathes new life into the game mode. The process of clearing Null World Boss was so different from any other World Boss in the game that for months afterwards, tier lists proliferated which dealt exclusively with which characters were useful in Null and which ones weren't. The entire collective community was focused on how to overcome the challenges that were intrinsic to this new boss, and certain characters who thrived in particular in the boss fight left particularly strong impressions. Gambit's fifth skill has ignore targeting and a large range, enabling you to essentially bait Null around the arena for the duration of the fight, which plays differently from any other world boss fight in the game. I remember getting my first Null clear using Gambit and being over the moon about it as if it were yesterday. Unfortunately, subsequent world boss legend entries have proven less innovative. Mephisto was a fairly strong second entry, but Ultron, Gore, Jean Grey, Ray and Kang have all kind of turned into DPS checks, doing nothing new other than increasing the HP bar and the damage dealt by attacks. There is a real increase in difficulty going to these new bosses, but that doesn't mean that they're compelling changes. This reliance on a formulaic development of new game entries, I would argue, is the source of Netmarble's content problem. Because the same characters that are useful in Null are useful in subsequent World Boss Legend entries, you don't have to change the way that you play to adapt characters from your previous teams to new bosses. In fact, I have several teams that I use across every single World Boss Legend because they just work for all of them. There's no meaningful difference aside from the arbitrary restrictions at higher levels on what characters you're allowed to use. I think that this problem could be solved as simply as introducing a second formula. For instance, Null's reaction to the Weapon Hex meta resulted in a situation where buffs are all that matters, and so every character that's good feels the same because you need the same set of buffs to succeed in World Boss Legend. Introducing a second World Boss Legend template where your characters are repeatedly and rapidly stripped of their buffs, but you can apply debuffs to weaken the boss down to where their base level is, would create an entirely different style of gameplay. That different style of gameplay would then incentivize building different styles of characters, characters who don't rely on buffs, but rather inflict massive amounts of debuffs to their targets. Alternating new bosses back and forth between the null template and this new template would then create a situation where, over time, what characters you want to build change, and new uniforms could be targeted towards whatever boss is current or whatever boss is previous to make them more or less relevant depending on your roster's current needs. This ability to incentivize different types of characters and release characters that are good for specific types of content isn't really effective when all content is following the same set of basic restrictions. The light at the end of the tunnel here is that in the Black Friday dev note, they acknowledge this issue and indicate that they're working on a new means of clearing world boss legend. Hopefully this is something really innovative that will 
actually change the way that we approach the game and make things interesting again, as opposed to just potentially adding an autoplay feature. However, irrespective of whether or not the developers are on the right page, I think that it's time that we as a fandom reassess the way that we critique this game. Endless cries of lackluster content and underwhelming update really fail to actually address the meaningful issues that could be improved upon to make this game better than it currently is. We all love this game and want to see it be the very best that it can be, but we need to work together and do thought-provoking analysis and actually address what the problems of the game are if we ever want to see changes that take it in that better direction. On that conclusive note, I'm interested to hear what y'all think of this style of video in the comments below. This is my first time doing something that's a little bit more in the realm of a video essay, and I think I enjoyed it, but it's definitely very different. Please do like, comment, subscribe. Those things all help me out substantially. We are really close to our next milestone at 250 subscribers, where I am going to do a raffle and give away a custom Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition homebrew subclass. So if you're interested in that, definitely subscribe. And if you want to see this turn into something that continues to happen long term, consider checking out my Patreon. I've got some really fun rewards on there. As always, thank you so much for giving me a bit of your time, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.